Who's ready for the word of the Lord tonight? I said, who's ready for the word of the Lord tonight? We are, I am consistently committed in this season to honoring your time and to making sure that, um, that I give you the word of the Lord in a timely fashion, especially uh, those who are making the sacrifice of time on a midweek. I haven't done uh, a first Wednesday, I don't know in how long, but I sensed in my spirit I was supposed to do this right here because the season is shifting. You're two weeks away from stepping into a new season. Literally, you're two weeks away from the season shifting. And so what we need to do is assess the season we came out of and we need to reset the expectation prophetically for the season we're stepping into. Is there anybody that believes that God's best has yet to be seen in this calendar year? Three, four, five. Let's get the worship team over here, please. I always want to see you guys. I want those who are leaders to be close by. I want you to go to Exodus chapter three. Um, I shared on Sunday that I had a follow-up doctor's appointment. How many people were aware of that? Well, I want to tell you that uh, my pulmonologist came uh, into, the, into the room, and he walks in. He's got all my charts and all of this stuff, and he comes up, and he gives me a fist bump. He's from India. He gives me a fist bump. He's like, explode it. I was like, okay, so I exploded. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was great. That was how he sounded. And so he pulls out these charts, and he starts talking to me. And yes, let's stand, because we're going to get into the word, and then you can sit down. And I'm kind of nervous, because I'd been having some, you know, little challenges, complications, whatever. And he was like, he was like, this is good. Everything's looking good. I was like, huh? I said, I don't feel good. I told him what was going on, and he said, I'm going to tweak this. We've got to change this medicine. But I need to listen because you look one way, but I have an instrument that can check what's going on on the inside. And so he says, take deep breaths, and he, he checks literally eight different places. And when he's done, he says, great. And I was like, I don't, what, what does that mean? So he shows me these, these other charts. He hands me my charts, and he shows me some of the challenges. And then he says, this is gonna take care of that. I've already order this, this will be in. It's, it, it's backed up in stock, but it's coming and that will help you too. And we're going to stay aggressive because we're going to make sure that these clots never come back. So I need you to know that tonight I'm not sitting down. Because I passed another benchmark in my health and development. So that chair is going to be empty tonight because I'm not sitting down for what God is doing. I had to sit for a season. But the season is changing. I need you to put it in the chat feed, Rock Family. The season is changing. And I need you to high five three people, fist bump them like my doctor fist bumped me. Tell them the season is changing. The season is changing. Yeah, you're coming out of debt. You're coming out of bondage. You're coming out of sadness. The season is changing. You're coming away from the pain. Your season is changing. Loneliness is leaving you. The season is changing. Your season is changing. Does anybody hear what I'm saying? Your season, your season is changing. We're going to stay in Exodus chapter 3. I can't seem to let this go. Does anybody remember the title from Sunday? Say it real loud. Moving day. For all of us, it is spiritual. For some of us, it is literal. That God is literally moving you from one place to another. He's moving you from an apartment to a house. Let me help you to understand. He's, every move in this season is a move forward, even if it's not a move upward. What does that mean? Even if it looks like you have to take a step back, it's, it's not. It just looks that way because God is strategic. If you know anything about chess, sometimes you move forward, then you scoot back. 
and you wait for an opportune time and then you move back up again. I need you to know that everything that's happening in your life right now is designed by God to move you forward. And sometimes we miss identify seasons in our life because it looks like he's holding us back. He's not holding you back. He's pulling you back. And he's pulling you back. And if he's pulling you back, that means he's got his hand on you, number one. And number two, he's never let go of any of his children and put them in harm's way. So don't be frustrated if this is what looks like a season where there's what seems to be regression. It's not. He's actually pushing you forward. And the only way to get you forward is to take you back. For some of you, for others, God is pushing you forward. But I need you to hear me very clearly. It does not feel good all the time. Very important that forward progress, depending on how fast you're going, could be very uncomfortable. You ask a fighter pilot that's going Mach 1 near the speed of sound how comfortable that is because sometimes you're moving so fast, the pressure from the gravity, the gravitational pressure at the speed that they're moving could cave your chest. The reason why God has been strengthening your spiritual muscles is because the elevation and the forward progress of your life is going to be so massive that you actually have to have more density in your spirit woman or in your spirit man to sustain where he's taking you. Your bones were too brittle to go forward. Because the blessing is going to be so massive, if you didn't have a strong internal structure, it would break you. Ah, he loved you too much to give you the wealth back then. You weren't ready for it then. You would have wasted it on a bad relationship. You would have wasted it on goofy things. God says, now I've given you wisdom, understanding, and I've removed some of the leeches off your life. Okay, Exodus chapter 3, reading from the New King James Version. I'm going to go starting at the first verse. Stay with me. Stay with me. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro. He was doing what? Tending the? So Moses was a shepherd. The Lord is my? Stay with me. Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord, freeze right there. We have to get this language correct. The word, the Hebrew word for angel of the Lord is two words together. I learned this by listening to another pastor uh, out of um, uh, Gateway Church, uh, Josh Morris. Pastor Josh Morris talked about this Hebrew word that angel of the Lord does not mean an angel. It is God in angel form. Or it is God in a form where men can see him. Now, who is the physical embodiment and complete representation of God in physical form? Jesus. Say it again. Jesus. So he's looking at a pre-incarnate Jesus. Jesus was in the desert I'm going somewhere. I know you're like, wait a minute, but Jesus wasn't born. See, what do you mean he wasn't born? We're not talking about the manifestation of Bethlehem. We're talking about the one that the Bible says through him, all things were made that were made and that one thing that was made was made without him. So he didn't just get here in the New Testament. You got the yip, 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 rewind all the way to Genesis and he was there. Let there be light. He was there because he is the light of the world. Light is illumination, revelation. Application. So understand that Jesus was in Genesis all the way to Revelation. You can find Jesus in every one of the 66. Holler at your boy if you see me in the street. Jesus is not new to the Old Testament. Stop thinking chronologically and think supernaturally and hey, eternally. The Bible says no man has seen God at any time. So here the angel of the Lord or God in angel form or God in a visible form appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I'll now turn aside to see this great sight why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. 
Moreover, he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I need you to understand, I've, I read this Sunday, but I'm reading it again. I need you to get this word. We don't get enough word. We have a lot of opinion, but we don't have enough word. He said, I'm the God of your father. Then he said, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. We've lost the reverence of God. We don't have that reverence anymore. People are very casual with the holy things of God. They're very casual. That's why you get a casual encounter. But those of us who reverence the presence of God, who prioritize the presence of God, who honor the nature of God and the essence of God and the, and the most highness of God, those of us who know when we feel the, the touch of the Holy Ghost, we bow our head. For those of us who quicken, anybody when you feel the Holy Ghost, oh, anybody ever, you know, it, it, it feels funny, but it's like you can't be normal. Let's be honest. You ever met somebody that you thought was famous or somebody you looked up to and you see him you're like, all right, be calm. Okay. <laughs> I remember I was at an event and Janet Jackson walked into the room and she walked right behind me. She, she said, hi. I was like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> eh, eh. Eh, eh, eh. cock a doodle doo. She had to play it off. Why? Because I was in the room. I didn't accidentally get there. I belong there. But sometimes you got to bring it in. You got to, yeah, yeah you, all right, all right, Janet, all right. You know what I'm saying? But sometimes you got to play it off because your emotions get the best of you. But when it's God, you can't, you can't, you can't keep it together. Even if you don't like God, if you don't honor him, you still got to, you still got to bow. You don't believe me? Ask the people that came to arrest Jesus the night he was betrayed. They're like, we're looking for Jesus. They got clubs, lanterns, and spears. He said, I am he. They all drew back and did what? Fell to the ground. They didn't want to worship. They had to. See, this is the part about every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess. They won't want to. Some folk won't want to do it, they'll still have to do it because it's God. Understand this, Moses hid his face because he knew he was in the presence of the Most High. He couldn't keep it together. You can't be casual in the presence of God. You can be casual in the presence of people. Don't ever be casual with the presence of God. Don't ever misidentify God as just somebody. Oh my God that the church would prioritize the reverence of God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Watch, here it is again, verse eight. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Who said they're coming to deliver them? God said, I have come down, I did it. Okay, oh, that's great, God. Thank you for letting me know that you're about to do something. Let me know how that works out. No, you stay right there, Moses. I have come down to deliver them and to bring them up. What did I just say? You going what? You going up. To bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. What is God saying? I know all the scenarios, all the situations. I have been listening to their prayers. I have seen their tears. I have heard their cries. I have been in the room while they cried in the fetal position, and the tears went from the right eye over the bridge of the nose to the left eye, caught a tear there and hit this corner and went down the side of the face into the ear, down onto the pillow. Is there anybody that cried sideways? When you've had to cry sideways, you know what I'm talking about. When the pain is so great that you don't even have strength to make a sound. Just God says, I've seen it. Here comes the 10th verse. Come now. Everybody say, come now. Come now. Therefore, and I will send you 
Oh, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Jesus. For those who don't know, Moses had a, a speech impediment. Many people believe he stuttered. Wait, you, you said you were coming down to, to get them. I am. I'm going to use you. What do you want me to, to, to do? I want you to talk. <laughs> you, you want me to, 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 to talk. So you're God. You made the whole universe. And of all the people that talk good, you chose the one that doesn't t talk good. Exactly. Because it, it is your humanity and your imperfections that show the power of my might. And my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And so the thing that you think I cannot use is the very thing I'm going to stand up in. The place of your handicap is the place of my holiness. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. We're going to stay right there. The title of tonight is Moving Day, semicolon, Executive Decision. I need everybody to say, Moving Day, Executive Decision. Go ahead and be seated. Go ahead and be seated. I'm not going to take long, but I just, I need you to grab this. Of all the people in all the world, God reveals himself in the midst of a burning bush at the base of Mount Horeb to a man named Moses who had been in the desert for 40 years. Everybody say 40. We know that 40 is the time of testing. It is the time of proving. Everybody say 40. We know Jesus was in the wilderness how many days? 40 days and 40 nights. We also know that the children of Israel ended up wandering in the wilderness. How long? 40 years. Okay, 40 years. There's that 40 again. All right, so uh, Moses was 40 years old when he left Egypt. He was born there. He was raised there in the house of Pharaoh. He was trained in all of the knowledge and wisdom of the Egyptians. We get it. And then he made a really, really bad decision. He did something really terrible. And he paid the cost and he fled as a fugitive from his home. And for 40 years, he probably stewed and lamented the missed opportunities, the doors that were closed, the longing and the sadness that comes with the regret of a bad decision. I'm only sitting for a, a moment for, for the purposes of an intended effect. Have you ever sat down and looked over your life and regretted some of the things that you've done? I'm going to need you to talk back. If you help me preach it, I'll be done very quickly. Imagine being Moses in the desert, just in the wilderness. They're not even your sheep. It's your father-in-law's sheep. And he's sitting out there, and all this, first of all, I'm, I am a leader. I was in the Egyptians' school of leadership. I was, I was, I'm on my way to being like deputy assistant to Pharaoh. I'm on my way to the highest levels. Then I did something really dumb and really terrible, and I think it just cost me my destiny. And now here I am, and I'm sitting in a desert tending sheep. When I went to school for this, I was trained for more than this. How did I end up here with all of my skills and all of my experiences? How am I not further along? And so for 40 years, he was faithful with his father-in-law's sheep. My first question to you is, have you been faithful with the sheep that God gave you? You're saying, well, pastor, I'm not a shepherd. I'm not talking about actual physical sheep. I'm talking about have you been faithful with whatever it is God put in your hands? Well, I don't know if I've done everything right. I didn't ask you if you've done everything right. No one's done everything right. I'm saying, are you still clocking in? Because God just needs to make sure that you're showing up because sometimes the victory is just showing up. 
I need you to get an amen and you need to be encouraged because life is hard. Let's, let's stop playing around. I'm so tired of this fantasy fairy tale that some of these Christian folk are, 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 are peddling. Jesus is not a magic band-aid for real life. He is the strength you need to navigate real life. Tell somebody, keep showing up. Yeah, you got to keep showing up. He says he was tending his father-in-law's sheep. Moses was a shepherd. I don't ever hear people talking about that. And why was he a shepherd and how come it took 40 years? Well, we learned on Sunday that God said, if you keep reading after the 10th verse, God says, I'm sending you back to Egypt for the people who wanted your life are dead. What Moses didn't know is that God was actually protecting him. What looked like he was lost, pushed back, forgotten about, was God actually hiding him from the people that were trying to kill him. And you're going to need to reposition your thinking on the seasons where it looked like you lost time, lost influence, lost opportunities because you didn't lose anything. He was hiding you. And so here's a man that's tending sheep. And then God says, now I need you to go shepherd my people out of this broken place. What kind of skills does a shepherd need? Somebody talk to me. Patience. Discernment? Why do you say discernment? He needs to understand and recognize when the enemy's coming to hurt the sheep and needs to be able to protect them. What else does a shepherd need? Love. Love. Why? Because sheep get on your nerve and do dumb things. And sometimes you want to leave it right there and let a wolf come eat it. You dumb. You did the same thing again. Ernest, I got you out of there last time. I pulled you out yesterday. You back there again. Like my wife talked about, there's this thing on Instagram that this, the shepherd pulls the sheep out and then lets him go. He runs and jumps back into the same crevice because that's what sheep do because they are not bright, which means they need someone to love them enough to love them past their natural inclination to self-sabotage. You've been frustrated with some of your family members and some of your close friends, but you didn't know that God actually has them in your life because they're your assignment. I know you didn't know, but you're being tested. You got to pass that test. You can't keep cussing them out in your head <laughs> or in the natural. <laughs> Because some of us have a couple people in our life, as soon as we see their number, oh my God, here they go. Here they go. You got two words when you answer. What now? Which jail? Which one I'm coming to? How much you need? How many of us got a couple people in your, in your life? Almost consistently, you know. Oh man, you can't. Listen, 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 <laughs> listen, I got this thing, listen, listen, I just need a few dollars, listen, I know, I know you got, you got some money, you over there preaching, man, <laughs> man, I love you, John, you my nephew, man, listen, 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 listen. <laughs> they're your assignment, they're your assignment, he's teaching you patience, and until you catch the fact that God wants you to have the heart for them that he has for you. Because while you're impatient with their development, how much patience did God have with you in your development? Can I get six amens? And a, ooh, that one, I felt that. Matter of fact, go on, get while you're sitting, just give them a praise break. Because while we're impatient with others, God has been real patient with you and I. All right, I'm, I'm just talking about me. I'm just talking about me. God has been real patient with me. So then, there's another shepherd too. Um, what's his name? Dave? David? David? His name King David? Talk to me. Act like you know what I'm saying. David was a shepherd too. 
but he didn't own those sheep either. It's funny, God is training you with other people's stuff. I've lost so much, you don't even own that. Oh my God. You're like, Lord, I want to own a home. Take care of your sheep. <laughs> but I don't have sheep. You got an apartment? <laughs> what do you mean, take care of my sheep? Did you vacuum your rug? Some of y'all missed this. God wants to make sure you're responsible where you are before he gives you more. Why would he give you a promise when you can't take care of the precursor? I never, I promise you, I never understood. Pastor Joel Osteen, um, he, he had like a, it, it's 2022. I would say his car was like a 2008, 2009, something. And it was spotless. I thought it was brand new. And he's like, I, I, I clean it all the time. <laughs> I clean this home, I clean this every week. And I know the Lord is blessing. He could probably get a new car. I know, I know he could get a new car. He don't need a new car because cars don't define him. But I know this. He stewards what he had with excellence. Somebody say stewardship. See, in this season, God is not giving more to people who he gave a little to and did less with it. Tell somebody stewardship. stewardship. Yeah, stop asking God to make you rich. Ask him to make you generous. Because it's the generous that he gives more seed to. Now, don't ask him for more money. Ask him for a heart of generosity. Because if he tweaks your heart and you're able to release it, he will be a conduit. He will make you a conduit for resources. Money is not your issue. Your heart is. This is good. This is good. Somebody say executive decision. So Moses killed somebody. Any murderers in here? Do not raise your hand. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, man. <laughs> it was a long time ago. I've got doll babies in my basement. <laughs> Security! Anybody in here ever been or know anybody that's been in jail? See how I did that? I covered you. Just in, and I'll keep your hands up. Just in case it's you, I put your family in there too. Do you or someone you know or love, have they ever been on the inside? <laughs> just up there with them, just... Listen to, right, to say. Isn't it, isn't it crazy who God uses to do the biggest things? When you read this book, you need to shout every time because everybody in there is like you and me. I'm about to mess y'all up with this. It's going to be short. We're going home. I'm so excited about this word, though. But listen to me. Moses killed somebody. I need y'all to get that. He killed a whole human. Now, he, he felt he had a good reason. This, but here's what's deep. He saw the Egyptian hurting a Hebrew. He waited till that fight was over. He didn't go right then, like if it was like self-defense, like let him alone, and he hit him, and he, you know, he hit his head on a brick. That's not what happened. The Bible said he looked this way and that. <laughs> That's premeditated. I let your boy. Let me tell you something. For some of us who understand court proceedings, there's justifiable homicide, manslaughter, <laughs> aggravated murder, and first degree. First degree means you had to think about it. You had to plan it. You plot it. And then you tried to escape it. We're not talking about self-defense. He's a murderer. 
murderer. Here comes the hot stepper, murderer. Moses is a gangster, murderer. Killing like that. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> oh, thank you, G. Ah, here comes a hot stepper, murderer. His name is Moses, murderer. Coming in the hell, he go murder. Kill the Egyptian, murderer. You missed your blessing, murderer. This is a quartet, murder. Moses killed him, murder. Buried him in the sand. Moses, you did it. You killed that man. You are a murderer. You are a murderer. Moses, you killed him. Moses, you killed him. And you tried to bury him. You tried to cover it up. But the God said no. Murder. Break it up. There has never been a quartet song about murder. We just made history. But that, that's a hit. <laughs> we got to do that. I'm not playing. That's going up on the gram this night. Moses, you killed him. Mur I need four old men in some suits, right? Murderer. And I need that one guy. I'm sorry, but that blessed my soul. <laughs> Stop it right now. PJ, I know you look, this is your whole, this is your whole thing. You in heaven right now. We need to have a quartet Sunday. Every song, quartet. We need to work on that now. I need to come in here Sunday. I need some old men in here, Jerry Curls. <laughs> I, need, I need a quartet because they don't know what day it is and at what time. And good evening. It's 8 in the morning. Good evening, y'all. This afternoon. <laughs> Stop. I got to finish. <laughs> hey, did Kai win? Did he win? They lost. <laughs> Pastor, <laughs> Pastor Lamore's son had their first football game today. And his son, they, they had their first game, the team lost. He's called to preach. He ain't called to play. Get him off the field. He's anointed to preach. <laughs> He just took me somewhere with that organ. Come on, sit down now. That's a good, I think I'm about to come back. I think that's the theme. It's a little quartet here. Listen here. Moses, <laughs> I don't even want to call y'all murderer. For the rest of your life, every time you read about Moses, murderer. I need one church mother. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Mo 
Moses. <laughs> oh, I wish YPJ was here. He would go right with me into this foolishness. Oh. He killed somebody. Elder Fowler, murder normally means the rest of your life is there are you ain't killed nobody and if you have don't confess in here <laughs> you're like well pastor actually many years ago <laughs> I know who you are you are a murderer stop it right now the next time you watch the news they're like he was charged with murder you're like murderer If I'm in the airport and I see O.J. Simpson, you know what you are, you're... <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Moses. I'm trying to make you stay. You just trying, you want me to stay in this foolishness. Moses should have been disqualified. It just shifted. Did you catch it? We're having fun, but I need you to catch this. What he did should have ended his life. But even as horrific a deed as what he did, he is not what he did. And God already had a plan to use him in spite of his worst moment. This is the moment where I'm going to need you to take a 10 second, get up, take off around here. The worst thing you did was not your end. It was your entrance into your season of development for what you were called and created to do. Some of you know the worst thing you did. Most of us will never know the worst thing that you did, but you and God know. But you still here with your hands still up, still praising God, and he never took his oil off you or his purpose from you. So somebody other than me needs to thank God that your worst moment did not do what it was intended to do. Maybe you didn't kill somebody. Maybe you slept with somebody. Maybe you lied on somebody. Maybe you stole something from somebody. Maybe you were an insecure hater that spoke death over somebody else's dream. But whatever it was, God said, that's a moment. It's not your totality. Somebody ought to give God a praise that he didn't let your worst moment be your last moment. Thank you, Jesus. I feel the Holy Ghost. God, he was, a, he was a murderer. You can't have some. Could you find somebody without a, a record? I could, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't be humble enough to give me all the credit. If they did everything right, they would think they deserve to be where, where I put them. I need some people that have been through hell. No, you don't deserve a thing God gave you, but he did it anyway. I wish there was somebody in here that would be honest to say, I don't deserve the favor on my life, but he chose it. It was an executive decision. I need you to understand there are people that don't like you on your job right now. They think they can do what you do better than you. They've got more skills. They've got more training, but they don't have God's favor. God made an executive decision. And I know they don't like you, but it's too bad. You can't do nothing about it. God has made an executive decision. Yeah, well, you know, that was just a one-time thing. God don't be, he don't use murderers. Come here, Paul. He was an accomplice. Because when they were killing Stephen... Who was the coat man? Hold my coat while I go kill it. God's got a thing about people who do terrible stuff and then in one moment he changes them. 
and he extracts value from the ashes. In a soramandi sekeresh. I need somebody to know God's about to extract value from the ashes of your worst season, your worst moment. He's going to extract value from the most painful thing you ever walked through. It, I know you wished it never happened, but that it happened and God didn't leave you was the purpose of allowing it to happen in the first place. So you know that when he says, lo, I am with you always, you know he really means it. Because the truth is, for some of us, everybody left except God. I wish I had a church that would give God the type of praise that he deserves because he did not leave you when he could have or he should have. I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. And so God saw that Moses took off. He was a fugitive from justice. They were after, he had warrants. He literally had warrants. And where did he run? He ran to Midian, 40 years, 40 years. Are there any cooks in here? What, not, I'm not talking about microwave, that's not cooking. <laughs> I'm talking about what I do, I cooks. I don't cook with a K, Courtney don't do that. Because I made homemade, I made homemade fettuccine Alfredo with chicken, my own sauce, okay? Heavy whipping cream, Parmesan cheese. I added a little Gouda in there, a couple of other spices. Don't play, I seasoned my chicken right. Little poultry season, little garlic powder, okay? I'm not giving you the rest of my seasoning because you don't know how to handle this kind of anointment. I need somebody to, uh, I cooks with a, with a S. You a cook. And I'm not talking about barbecue that you put a hot dog. Are there any barbecue masters, pitmen? You know how to cook. Where's the cook? Stand up if you a cook. Some of us know that when you're cooking something, you can't cook a roast in 10 minutes. You can't cook a turkey in a microwave. Are there any, is anybody here ever made soup? Homemade soup. I didn't, don't, if, if you say you make soup and you use a can opener, get out. You didn't make soup. If you did this, you didn't make soup. I'm talking about when you cut the vegetables, you cut up your parsley, you crush your garlic, huh? Salt free Mrs. Dash. Celery, bits of chicken, broth and stock. But then it's got to do what? Tell somebody simmer. I know you at a boil because you think they forgot. I know you're at a boil because things are moving slow, but God says simmer. Oh, you missed it. I know you feel like you could do it. You can go right now. God says, you're not done. I'm still seasoning you. I need you to write this down. Everybody write this. This season was for seasoning. I'm preaching better than they're shouting. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to give him a chance to catch up with me. Because Moses is a murderer. <laughs> All right, stop. This season is for seasoning. Some things, actually, when you cook them, if you're a real cook, you don't just eat the first night. Because if it's seasoned right, it actually tastes better. Somebody ought to shout. The people that tasted you in the last season, the people, they, they left too soon. They missed that, ooh. You better be glad that that relationship left. It didn't work out. They thought you were too bland. They didn't stay long enough. God had to marinate you. But the person that's coming now is gonna love all the seasoning all the flavor, all the time that God invested. I need you to give God a shout. This season was for seasoning. I need everything in here to give God a 20 second praise break. On your mark, get set, pray. I said, give him a praise. You got 15 seconds.
don't do it, I feel the Holy Ghost. It was for seasoning. Don't do it, sir. I said seasoning. They left too soon. And God wanted them to leave. That's why he didn't put certain things in the pot while they were there. He didn't bring everything because he knew they'd stay and you didn't have enough discernment to know that they're actually not for you. They're actually for what they could get from you. So God kept you bland for a reason until they left. Now he's adding his final touches. He's sprinkling some more favor, some more grace. Now he's giving you more discernment. Oh, and he's giving you another dose of the Holy Ghost. Tell somebody I've got new seasoning. Uh, mm, taste that. Ah, that's process. That's prayer. That's praise. Taste that. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You know what it what it tastes like to be cooking and simmering for 40 years? The meat is tender and falls off the bone. I worship faster. I pray sooner. I cry quicker because he seasoned me. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Go ahead and cry out. Hallelujah. Somebody cry out. Hallelujah. 40 years of seasoning. But Lord, I learned all the knowledge. You have book knowledge. I'm going to teach you something in this wilderness that books can't teach you. I need somebody to know. I know you got your degree, but God took you to advanced classes. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. And at 80 years young, 40 years of seasoning. So you got 40 years of foundational development. Now you got 40 years of seasoning. Where did he season him? In the, I'm sorry, in the, and God said, I'm going to need you to lead them back here. How long was Moses being seasoned and then God brought him back to his original promise how long were the children of Israel in the wilderness before they walked into their original so God actually was allowing Moses to feel what the people he was leading were about to feel you're trying to figure out why you're going through so much it's not for you. It's for the people you're called to lead out. Oh my God. You need to get excited. You're not being punished. You're being expanded. He's giving you empathy and training. He's developing you to have patience because these sheep are going to be out here for 40 years and you need to be able to look at them and say, I know what it's like to be in this desert for 40 years because I was in this desert for 40 years. Don't give me a leader that ain't been where you're trying to take me. Oh, Lord. People are about to dine off the experiences of your wilderness season. Let me tell you something. You can smell good cooking down the street. You don't know that your life is giving off a fragrance that is attracting people who are hungry for truth, who are hungry for authentic leadership and brokenness. You don't realize that your life, even the areas where you feel most shame, are actually being utilized to bring other people into the presence of the God that wants to free them from the shame and the fear that the worst thing they ever did disqualifies them from being used by God in the future. Moses then goes on to say, God, I'm not good at communication. I don't think you should use me. I don't think I'm qualified. And God's response was, who made man's mouth? Who made your mouth? Who made the deaf or the blind or the mute? Is it not I? Do you understand how deeply wounded you have to be to be looking at God and telling God, I think you've made a mistake. He wasn't being dishonorable. 
because if he had been dishonorable, he would have died on the spot. What he was saying is, I know we just met, and apparently you know me in a way that I don't know myself. But with what I know about me, I don't think I'm qualified for what you're asking. And I, it's not here, but what I can imagine, the, the, the response is, I didn't ask you what you thought about you because I've made an executive decision based on factors that you don't even know. Stop arguing with people and don't agree with people who don't believe you deserve what's coming or what you have. I need you to disagree with them and agree with God. God made an executive decision about you. 19 of y'all. I believe somebody online is getting completely set free. I'm not the only person that has tried to forfeit destiny because you didn't feel worthy of what he gave you. If he didn't want you to have the job, you wouldn't have it. If he didn't want you to have that car or that house, you wouldn't have it. If he didn't want to have you walk through that door, he would not have opened it. You better read Revelation 3 and 8. It's God who opens the door that no man can shut. It was an executive decision. And here's what your haters and your enemies need to know. All of their plotting together means nothing because God is the one that has the final say. God made an executive decision. God's going to use you to speak to youth about purity and holiness. No, nah, not me. I was the furthest thing from pure or holy. He's going to teach you how to speak to them about not allowing their pain to create more addictions. I used to smoke the dro every day. I still smokes it. Yeah. That's going to make you a perfect example of what it means to talk to somebody else about how the power of God can deliver you in a moment and take you from an artificial high to a real high in the Holy Ghost. Can I get an amen in here? Our church is filled with people that God has made an executive decision about. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Every broken thing that I've ever manifested was always there. Y'all just never saw it. The difference between me and you is the spotlight's on me, you get anonymity. Because we all going through things, we all have struggled, we all have failed, we all have made really bad decisions. It's not an excuse, it's truth. And there are people that say, mm, 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 look at that. Girl, you know good and well, she don't deserve that job. She don't deserve that man. I don't deserve, she don't, de and he don't deserve it. They don't, I, you know what? I hear what you're saying, but unfortunately, it's not in your hands. I need somebody to go ahead and, and, and let it out. You ain't got to get up, but somebody ought to, I know that's right. You need, actually, you need to get excited because they're, they hate your guts and they're still watching. can't stand you, but they got to know where you are and what you're doing at all times. You might as well get in my car for the way you stay on my pages, live in my house, pay some bills since you're here so much. Tell somebody executive decision. Let me let y'all go. No, sir. Keep going. He said, I'm an executive now. I can make those types of decisions. He made an executive. Because Moses was a murderer. <laughs> Bring it up. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> stop it, stop it, stop it. Moses tried to talk God out of calling him. God said, I'm, I'm not changing my mind. Get this in your spirit. God's not changing his mind. Put it down. Elder Tracy, I'm so glad you take notes. You got to take notes for the whole front row. <laughs> you got them. Oh, sorry, Elder Del Delroy, Delroy from Jamaica said, I am taking my notes in my phone. I read. 
Moses was a murderer. That's the only note you got. <laughs> Here's the other part I need you to get, Denzel. Super important. He killed a man and God still used him and it to be an agent of deliverance for others. Three words. Put it down. It's going to change your life. God wastes nothing. And man, I don't know how he's going to redeem the, some of the things I've done. Hush. It, it, he wastes nothing. He's going to say it again. He's going to use it all. He's going to use the worst moments, the sins that everybody wants to crucify you for, that they do, we just don't know. Ooh, that's, I really want to stay there, but I don't want to stay. Elder Day, I really want to leave it alone. No, because it's going to sound. I'm real tired of church folk trying to throw other people away because you want to pick on their sin. Because yours has not been yet exposed. Be careful how you talk about God's kids that have made bad decisions and gone through. Because I can assure you, it's a big screen with your name on it. God wastes nothing. He's going to use every single piece of it. The last season was for what? Seasoning. Why? So that people can trust you with their brokenness because they know that you were broken too, but you didn't stay that way. Some of you are saying, well, pastor, I'm struggling right now. Get up! I'm laughing because in my mind, I heard, get on up. And then I was like, no. <laughs> stay on the scene. Like a praising machine. Stop, 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 don't do it. <laughs> Get up! Get up! Get on up! Come on out of there! Break it down! Listen. I'm sorry, Pastor Robert, help me with this scripture. A just man falls only once. I'm sorry, say it again. Uh, she said, nope, seven times. Spoken like someone that has fallen. <laughs> Not playing, <laughs> but it might be. A just man falls how many times? Not a bad man. Not a bad woman. Not a nasty. A just. That means somebody whose heart wants to do right but their flesh keeps doing dumb stuff. Well, that doesn't seem biblical. Well, you haven't read what Paul said. That which I do, I don't want to do. And what I don't want to do, that I... I fail. And God says, get up! Stop. <laughs> somebody over here online, somebody was like, get on up. But it's true. Because church culture is counting on you to live in shame. Because there are some people who communicate from pulpits that need you to never get free so they can have a position. Because if you ever get free, you won't need their lies. If a just man falls seven, it doesn't mean only seven. You're like, well, I've fallen more than seven. I did seven yesterday. No, 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 no. Seven is the complete, if seven is the number of what? What he's saying is if you've made a complete failure of yourself, get up. Put it in the chat feed before I come through the internet. That would be crazy if I just <laughs> poke, poke my head through the screen like, get up! <laughs> tell somebody, get up. It would be a good gift, wouldn't it? Write it down, tell them, get up. I don't care what you've done, get up. I don't care if you sinned this afternoon. Get up. Stop highlighting your negative, and I need you to highlight the blood. 
The reason why you love Jesus is because the blood has been applied. And I don't care if you're still in process, get up. I don't care where you fell, get up. The issue in this season is not if you sin. The issue is if you get up. Because repentance means I'm turning. How many of us in here who are parents got mad at our kids the first time they tried to walk and then fell and beat them? Why would you beat a baby who's trying to walk? Nobody would do that. We are parents. They fall. What you say? Y'all missed this. Well, after the third or fourth time, they didn't get it. Did you just leave them down there and just let them? I'm sorry, say it again. You do what? You help them. Come on, baby. So what do you, you take them by the hand so that they can understand balance, right? Sometimes you grab them by the shirt so they don't even know that you're helping them. Because what you, and at some point you let the shirt go. They still think you're there. They just see your shadow, but they don't know you let go. Some of y'all don't know this. God's been sustaining you and you thought he was still holding your shirt, but you've been free for a while now. God's not holding your shirt. You got strength on the inside. I need you to give God a praise because you are completely free, whether you knew it or not. I'm here to declare tonight that you are free. You ought to give him a get up praise. I dare you to give him a get up praise. I said, I dare you to give him a get up praise. Did you hear what I said? I said, I need you to give him a get up praise. Yeah, like, I don't know what that means. You know what that, here's what a get up praise is. A get up praise is, I know I blew it. I know I messed up, but I know I love God. So I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna try it again. And if I fall, I'm gonna say, Lord, I'm sorry. I still gotta deal with this thing. I'm giving it to you, but I'm gonna get back up because my enemies want me to stay here. My flesh wants me to stay here. My broken mentality wants me to stay here, but I'm gonna get up. Tell somebody, get up. No, I don't, I, no, 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 you missed it. I said, tell somebody to get up. If Moses had stayed in his worst moment, the children of Israel would still be sitting over there in bondage. But because he was able to get in agreement with God to some measure, the children of Israel now walk in blessing. Hit me. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. Break it down. Every yes, sir. Do the people want the song? Everybody standing. Get up. <laughs> no, they was like, what? I was offense. No, I mean spiritually. Get, but also in the natural. Get up. <laughs> At home, get up. If you're in the car, don't get up. <laughs> You're on the highway. You're doing 100 on the highway. And if the devil's in the front, get the heck out of my way. Okay. Stop it. Moses said, I, I think you've made a mistake. God says, I made an executive decision. But I killed somebody. I know that. I was there when you did it. I tried to bury him in the sand. I know, but you can't bury things in the sand. Because the wind of the Holy Spirit is going to expose that. I didn't want you to bury it. I wanted you to deal with it. God wants to deal with the issues that you think have disqualified you from being utilized in the next season. Forty years he was in that wilderness because the people he was called to lead were going to be 40 years in that wilderness. If you want to know the people that you're called to lead and have influence over, look at your worst season and how he brought you out. And there are people who were where you were who need to know what comes after this. You have no clue the level of influence and anointing that the season of your greatest pain is going to produce. You have no clue the level of influence that's coming because you had the strength to get up. And there will always be people who do not want you to get up. And they will want you to live in that worst moment. 
And if any of them are close to you, and you, go, you know what? You remember that time? You know what? I just realized your proximity to me kind of needs, you know what? Because I don't need people who say they love me constantly reminding me of what I used to be and what I used to do. Because that means that's how you see me. And you need me to stay that for your own insecurity. I am not that moment. Why does God use John Gray? He doesn't, ugh. Why does God use such and such? And it, it's an executive decision. Moses said, I don't think I'm qualified. God said, I didn't ask you. Gideon, I don't think I'm qualified. I didn't ask you. David was not qualified. God, I didn't ask you. There were seven in front of him. I don't care who's in front of him. I'm choosing him. Because I see from a vantage point that others do not. The oil on your life and the pain it took to get it is enough seasoning for the people that you are called to lead. Get up. Lead. Love. And live. Live free. Don't live in shame. Stop apologizing. If you tell God you're sorry one more time, I learned this from Minister Dante Latson today. We had a beautiful time of truthful conversation. He said, Pastor, I love you. Don't say I'm sorry no more. Mm -mm. The best sorry is a changed life. Take it from somebody who's had to get up. Get up. And if God gives you a voice, a mic, a platform, an opportunity, an open door on your job, area of influence, you use it. Don't worry about who doesn't think you deserve it. It doesn't matter because they couldn't stop anything God wants to do in your life. Moses, I appreciate that you don't think that I know what I'm doing, but I've made my decision. Moses said, what about my brother? I know Aaron. I know he's more articulate, but he's not you. And I, I, he can come along, but I ain't talking to him. You, you really got to read this. God was, I'm not talking to Aaron. I'm talking to you. You can talk to Aaron, but Aaron, Aaron better not talk to me. Because I've made my decision. You don't know how valuable you are. You don't know what you carry. Some of y'all still, you're like, really, Lord, me? You're going to use me? How many people have said, you're going to use me? The answer is yes. I really want to say a couple things. Yes! Goofy? Yes. <laughs> no, but I'm not worth, don't you say it again. I'm God. My presence here makes you worthy. The fact that I'm conversing with you at all makes you worthy. Hands lifted. Hands lifted. God's made an executive decision about you. You are more than worthy of what's coming. You are more than worthy of the opportunities, the advancement. And I want you to know that anything that you think you lost, you did not lose it, it was removed from opportunities to finance to relationships. He's not going to waste anything. I said he's not going to waste any of your pain. I'm not the only person that's cried at night. I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one that's cried when no one was around and said, God, I just, I just want to come home. Has anybody ever prayed that just you're so hurt you don't feel like you have any value. God, I just want to come see you. He said, I love you. You're not coming to see me. I'm going to come see you. You got work to do. Get up. Get up. I've made an executive decision about your life. Father, bless your people here and around the world and let them 
Walk in the confidence that comes with the conversation that you initiated. They missed it, PJ. I said, let them have confidence that comes knowing that the conversation was initiated by God. There is no scripture that says Moses was ever seeking God, Elder Fowler. He was not looking for God, but God was waiting on him. He never prayed, make me a leader, make me a deliverer. He didn't even pray. He was just living. And then God showed up and said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And I have heard the cries of my people, and I have come down to deliver them. Come now, Moses, and I will send you. Your worst moment was training for the reigning that you're about to occupy. If you're in this room, and you need to, <laughs> this altar call is different. This altar call is an acceptance of yourself. Some of you have rejected you because of what you know about you. But God says, I knew what you were when I called you. I'm not changing my mind. For those who need to make a decision to leave the shame of the past season and come into the authority of the next one, come to the altar. Come to the altar. Leaving the pain behind, leaving the shame behind and saying, God, I am going forward. I am going to agree with you. see the anointing of entrepreneurship on you all and I saw six million dollars coming to fund the vision I don't know if you all have begun any conversations around business or an idea or something that is designed to help people in any way whether it be uh, retail or anything in the area of business or help anything in that area God is going to breathe on it and you will have resource for the vision write it out if you haven't written it write it God's got his hand on y'all continue to live holy serve the Lord stay on your face lead her in a righteous path and honor her as a Proverbs 31 woman as you all continue your courtship you all are connected relationally. Y'all dating and all of that. That's your wife. I just didn't see the ring. I wanted to make sure. So good. Come on. I need you to know that God has put something and infused you all. So this covenant has now been blessed with an entrepreneurial anointing. I know this sounds crazy because you, you don't have a business yet. All right, good. Guess what? Moses had no training. To lead people he led sheep but that was all the training he needed for what was coming there will be a moment of suddenly a burning bush moment where you will go from what you were doing to the aha of your destiny it is Ramandish. and when that moment comes you're going to shift trajectory and God is going to breathe on whatever it is he's handing you and you will never lack for resource Thank you, Jesus. Father, I'm praying for everyone at this altar, hands lifted, maybe not both, even if it's just one. Father, I'm praying for my family tonight. I'm praying for my brothers and sisters. Many of us have been so wounded by the last season that we don't know how in the world you're gonna use us in the next season, but you've made an executive decision about us. And whether it was murder or some other egregious thing that we think disqualifies us, even through our bad decisions, you have made your decision about us. 
God, may we never again agree with our circumstances or past sin. May we agree with the word. We will move forward. And we will be who you called us to be. Dun, 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 dun. In Jesus' name. I pray for a fresh oil and a fresh wind of the Holy Ghost to whew, infuse you with a fragrance of freedom. And I pray further that you, when you lay down tonight, that you will leave the, the burden of the shame of your bad decisions take the lessons from the mistakes and now say, Lord, if you want to use my worst moment to lead others out of bondage, then you can use me. If that's your prayer, say, use me. In Jesus' name, amen. If there is someone here that wants to be a part of this church, or you want to get saved, I want you to join me on this stage right now. If you want to join this church or you want to give your life to Jesus, meet me on this stage right now. Mm -mm -mm. If there's anybody that wants to be a part of this church, if you want to get saved, rededicated, or you want to say, I want to be a member of this church, you can join me right here. Come up here. I need, I need somebody to do a little bit better than that. What's your name, sweet girl? Johanna. Johanna? Johanna. Johanna. Nice to meet you, sweet girl. Y'all gonna do better than that for our brother. Come stand right next to me. I don't know your story, but I do know the glory that's coming. And you are absolutely worthy of the freedom, the newness, and the joy that comes with this new season. Don't beat yourself up for anything that you think you've done that's so terrible. God saw it all, he knew it all, and he never changed his mind about you. You're not accidentally here, you're exactly where he wants you. On the stage, facing God's people, being prepared to lead. I need you all to see the power of the Holy Spirit that can draw a young black man and a young white girl from a sermon about a man that lived 4,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. How is it that God could send a word through a broken vessel that would reach such two disparate groups? It was an executive decision. God wanted my voice in the earth. The reason why I'm alive is because my work was not done. It's not done. And, and the day that he's finished, he'll take my breath and I'll be back with him. But until then, I got a charge to keep and a God to glorify. Johanna, tell me your name, King. Vaughn. Vaughn. <laughs> Johanna, I need y'all to pray this prayer with me and all your new families going to pray it together. Let's say it together. Lord Jesus, it's me. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. Thank you for the blood that was shed for me. I receive the free gift of salvation, not through my works, but the finished work of the cross. 
The blood is enough to pay for all my sins. Now, Holy Spirit, come live inside and teach me how to be more like Jesus each and every day. You are my Savior and my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Can somebody thank God? Oh, y'all got to thank God. High five, sweet. Hey, Pastor Lacey, come up here real quick. Johanna, can you do me a favor? Who's here with Johanna? Where's your mom? Oh, there she is, your mom and your sister. You got a beautiful heart here that you're raising. I just want to tell you, she's got a wonderful heart. And she did this on her own, didn't she? <laughs> Listen, Johanna, I want you to go. Come here, Pastor Lacey. This is Pastor Lacey. She's just going to get a little bit of information. Do you want to get baptized? Good, there it is. Vaughn, you getting baptized? Or you already been baptized? You'll do it again? It's a few of us that's going to do it again. Can we celebrate our brother and our sister? If you will go with her just for a couple minutes. Welcome home, sweet girl. Let's go this way, Vaughn. Can we celebrate our brother and our sister? Come on. Online. Online, if you want to join, text member to 95555. Text the word member to 95555 or the word saved to 95555. Have you been blessed tonight? I said, have you been blessed tonight? What an amazing time. Oh, I love y'all. This Sunday morning, 815 and 1130. And we're going to be out of service by 1245 and at 1130 because the game start at one. Pastor Charles, you're a hater. Don't shake your head like it'll never happen. Bet me right now. Bet me some money. $5. Five dollars. Okay, before one o'clock. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you. Cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord God be gracious to you. Show you his favor. And give you his peace. Hug three people on your way out the door. And tell them God made an executive decision. <laughs>